Funding for New Mexico in Focus provided by viewers like you. This week on New Mexico in Focus, removed from committees. Reaction from our line opinion panel as Senator Daniel Ivy Soto resigns from a key leadership position. And... I think when I'll be satisfied is when our children are thriving and when our Native American children and the four group children are given the opportunity and are excelling. The lead plaintiff in the Yazi Martinez lawsuit voices her frustration as new education funding comes up for a vote. New Mexico in Focus starts now. Thanks for joining us this week. I'm your host, Gene Grant. Republican candidate for Secretary of State Audrey Trujillo is removing an offer from her campaign the chance to win a free gun if you donate $100 or more in a raffle. In just over 20 minutes, I'll ask the line opinion panel if it will cause her any long-term damage as polling already shows an uphill battle against incumbent Democrat Maggie Toulouse Oliver. An influential but often overlooked voting bloc is rallying ahead of the election. In about 10 minutes, I speak with four leaders in New Mexico's African-American community about their efforts to get out the vote. Then in the second half of our show, we hear from Wilhelmina Yazi, the lead plaintiff in the Yazzie Martinez lawsuit. She explains why she thinks Constitutional Amendment 1 is a major opportunity to reach the educational goals she helped set. And the line panel reacts to news that funding benchmarks made in response to that lawsuit have been met. But first, another break in development in the scandal surrounding Senator Daniel Ivey Soto. Let's get straight to the line. Welcome to our line opinion panelists. This week, we're happy to be joined by Algernon Damasa. He's investigative and enterprise reporter at the Las Cruces Sun News. Attorney Sophie Martin joins us. And it's great to see former state rep Justine Fox Young with us as well. Thank you all for being here. For the second week in a row, we start with new developments in the sexual harassment accusations against Senator Daniel Ivey Soto. Breaking as we tape this, Senator Ivey Soto resigned his position as chair of the Senate Rules Committee after being removed from the Finance Authority Interim Committee over the weekend. Democratic Senate leadership had planned to meet to discuss his removal later on Thursday this week, but Mr. Ivey Soto made the decision for him. What changed? Uh, let me start with Algernon here. He had been pretty defiant, Algernon, on this idea of due process. Um, what changed here in your view? It's hard to guess, certainly. We weren't in the room, but any guesses on what you think may have happened? What made a huge difference was uh, the Santa Fe reporter getting its hands on an investigative report that right. showed that two of the three findings had been substantiated, whereas the senator had been making statements implying that there were no adverse findings and essentially implying that he had been exonerated when that was not the right. case. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's an example of uh, the way leaks have been playing out in a process that does not have enough sunlight, leaks become very powerful mm -hmm. and they can be weaponized in various ways. And you have also this plot line about um, the Senate President Pro Tem, Mimi Stewart, uh, basically threatening to leak the report if uh, leak documentation if the senator did not uh, yield some of his leadership positions. And mm -hmm. so uh, lots of accusations back and forth, but hey, why, you know, one way to sort of de-weaponize and demilitarize leaks is to revise our processes so that they are still fair and accountable, but you don't have things operating in secret. Mm -hmm. Sophie, interestingly, um, that op-ed by Mr. Ivy Soto in the journal uh, a week or so ago claiming his innocence really took this to a whole nother place. I, I just... I'm curious, looking back at your thoughts on that, but then also stitch it to what we've heard, learned today, where it just seemed like he was in a corner and really didn't have many options. Did he yeah, paint I mean, himself I in a corner? Mm -hmm. I assume that on Thursday, he basically did a head count and realized that his, he, he wasn't going to prevail here. Right. Um, you know, I think that uh, while... So let me just say I'm a lawyer, but I also work in communications and have for many years. And mm -hmm. and one of the real challenges in moments like what what, you know, Ivy Soto was was confronted with is you want to clear your name. You want to get your side of the story out. You want to spin. Um, but it seemed clear to me that he wrote that op ed or his team wrote that op ed, however it works, worked for in that circumstance. Um, we, on the assumption that this 
that this that they were safe in terms right. of what they were saying that they were protected and this is one of the real challenges in situations like this when for instance an accuser can't tell their side of the story publicly um, because of a because of a, a gag type situation and mm -hmm. the accused can kind of go out there with feeling some confidence that um, their side of the story won't be rebutted publicly. You know, this really, to Algernon's point, um, th this could have, I suppose, gone a little differently if the, the leak hadn't happened, mm -hmm. or at least taken quite a bit longer for the rest of the information to come out. Um, and, you know, I, I think right now the commentary about like, look, you can't really look at a deadlocked panel given the, the findings that were issued. You can't look at a deadlocked panel and say, oh, exonerated. Right. And, and to that end, one of the imperfections of, of our legal process and the process that we see here is that, um, you know, we have the presumption, of course, in our criminal courts of of innocence it's not the same presumption necessarily in other areas but but um you know uh, a deadlock a mistrial things like that that's not that's not exoneration and that's how ivy soto tried to right. tried to spin this and so now he's got two problems he's got the underlying claims but then he also has i think got to deal with this issue of whether he can be trusted in his public statements and potentially as private statements in the future. That kind of spin um, often comes back to bite the person who tries it. That's an interesting point there. Uh, Representative Fox Young, I got a quote from Mr. Ivy Soto, quote, um, it's from a letter, by the way, he has submitted uh, with his resignation. I know I still have much to learn about being a servant leader and I commit myself to improvement in that area. The problems we face are too great and we must all work together. My question is, what happens next? Obviously, the full Senate and the full deal would have to remove him, you know, with a two-thirds vote in the 42-member uh, Senate. Is that a possibility uh, at this point, or is there enough mea culpa here that he can just kind of move on and just maybe improve himself and keep going? What's your sense of that? Well, my first thought is the fact that we have to sit here and try to read the tea leaves to figure out what happens next right. shows you how screwed up this process is mm -hmm. and how murky it's been. I mean, I don't know what else you'd expect from a legislature that is policing itself. Right. You know, they're, they've are they created this star chamber slash whatever it is. <laughs> um, but it, it's very problematic. You know, there's no predictability for all the stakeholders and mm -hmm. the accused and the public. I mean, what is going on up there? You know, right. Mimi Stewart's taking the helm. Senator Stewart is meeting out punishment now. I mean, it's a banana republic. Mm -hmm. uh, so I don't know what's going to happen. I think from a PR perspective, perhaps Senator Ivy Soto has done enough to calm things down for a short time, but it, I could critique his handling of, of the situation all day. Sure. It's, it's been really bungled. But, but the, as, as Algernon says, the process is so flawed. Right. I hope what happens, what comes out of this is um, some more predictability and, and some reform of, of how this works. It shouldn't be done um, in, in such an opaque way. Yeah. And, and I mean, that's the whole problem, right, with the Me Too movement. I mean, we're trying to get to a place where we can we can arrive at the truth, we can arrive at a just solution without getting to cancel culture, without having all the vitriol and litigating these things in the press. Mm -hmm. Everything went wrong here. Right, um, right. So I, I don't know what happens to him, but this process needs to be fixed. Algernon, on that point, um, this idea of the four people voting on someone's political future, and we don't know how they vote, and now Daniel Ely this week, Representative Eli this week is saying, look, we need a fifth member here who knows about these harassment issues, who's not an elected person to break ties. Is, that, is the public going to be accepting of, of people voting on people's future and not knowing how they voted in these things? I mean, there's something almost Banana Republic, which was just mentioned <laughs> about that as well. Yeah, I mean, it addresses part of the problem, but I, 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 I'm not sure it goes far enough. And I don't think, uh, I, I think that in the session, they're going to have to look at statutory changes right. to how this works, because yeah. we can talk a lot about due process. We can talk a lot about the presumption of innocence. And these are concepts that we understand as part of a 
open proceedings, civil trials, criminal trials in which there is an independent judge and and evidence that is presented in a in, generally in public settings. And that's not what we have here. We don't have that kind of process. You have senators voting about colleagues. Right. And of course, these people have their own relationships and their own pressures. Uh, I would not want to be a senator who crosses ways with someone like Senator Ivy Soto. Um, mm-hmm. I would not want to be you know, part of the problem here is that we have lobbyists and people who've been affected by his behavior who have very important matters coming before Mm -hmm. his committees as well as the senate as a whole Mm -hmm. and so really i mean i i don't know that a uh, you know a fifth vote what that addresses is the problem of a tie and you introduce somebody who is not an elected member of that body who is an attorney who has some professional expertise in the area i you know that certainly there's some improvement there, but I, I, I think it's a drop in the bucket. Honestly. Gotcha. Sophie, real quick, got to give you the last word on this. I'm, mm-hmm. I'm, you know, this is not a difficult prediction. Let's say he does stay and every woman up there just basically shuts him out. You, you, do you know what I'm saying here? They just don't deal with him at all. What, what good does that do him to stay in an environment like that? Because you can pretty much guarantee if he skates through on this, that's pretty much what he's going to find next, uh, next session. I think, I think, unfortunately, Gene, uh, and I apologize for saying this to you of you, but I think that's naive. Okay. Because, because to the extent that he retains any form of power in the in the system, the first time he's a he's a determinative vote on a piece of legislation, mm. you know, he's mm-hmm. the one you you've got to turn. Um, these con- the, the constituents, the lobbyists, et cetera, et cetera, will not have a choice. Um, but to but to work with him right. and um, you know in the in the the boiler room that is the legislature you know he it's not going to take that long for people to realize we we can't ostracize a member a particular member forever right it's it's I gotta say of the process as a whole it's unfortunate that this I'm, I've been thinking of it as a stress test of this system. Um, has happened at this time and has gone so badly, you know, mm-hmm. the stress test is going to happen eventually. That's right. I hope, as Algernon said, I hope that there are more significant uh, improvements made to the system reforms made because it's very apparent that that's needed. Good points there. Thanks to our line of opinion panel on that one. We'll meet back here at the virtual roundtable in about 10 minutes to talk about the Secretary of State's race and the potential campaign finance violation that's been stirring headlines this week. From this Yazi Martinez school suit, um, I started the, the case when my son, my oldest son, was in third grade, and now he's in his second year of college. And we won the case almost five years ago, and that was a big step to try to, you know, um, get our education system back on track to get off of that 50th in the country. Um, we haven't seen many changes yet. I haven't seen many changes. Looking ahead to November 8th, a relatively overlooked voting demographic is getting a big push to make themselves heard. The New Mexico Black Voters Collaborative is partnering with more than a dozen nonpartisan groups to educate and encourage black people to get out and vote. Earlier this week, I spoke with two representatives from that group and two more key figures in New Mexico's African-American community to see why they believe their voices could make a significant difference on Election Day. I want to start with Mason Graham with the New Mexico Black Voters Collaborative. Mason, thank you very much for joining us. And for all the folks out here, we'll introduce you one at a time as we go along here. Mason, what was the impetus uh, from, for the New Mexico Black Voters Collaborative uh, to start this process in the first place? What was going on out there that make, made the group decide that this effort was uh, worth having? Well, this was, uh, uh, thank you, Gene, for having us. And this was an effort that was brought to us by Uh, Dr. Harold Bailey from the Albuquerque branch of the NAACP as one of the only black led voting rights organizations here in the state. It's extremely important for us to make sure that we're getting out the message for people to know that the election is coming up. This general election is going to be a very pivotal election. As we all know, we have some very important issues that have come to light this last election season, and we really want to encourage folks to participate, educate themselves and get out the vote. 
Gotcha. Appreciate that. And the previously mentioned Dr. Harold Bailey. Doc, always good to have you. Tell the importance of having an NAACP in this effort. Talk, talk, talk to us about that as well. Well, the organization uh, has always, historically speaking, has always been involved as far as uh, getting Black people registered to vote and, and people of color and women. And so this is just a concerted effort of a lot of groups to come together to make sure that young people and young adults get a, the opportunity to understand how important it is to vote in November uh, elections. Mm -hmm. and, uh, Dr. McNeil contacted me initially uh, uh, with this idea to try to formulate a coalition statewide, and he came up with the numbers. And uh, I contacted Ms. Uh, Kathy McGill at the New Mexico Black Leadership Council, and mm -hmm. therefore I, I uh, ran into Mr. Graham. So it's, uh, it's a nice uh, collection of individuals. Oh, without saying, which brings us to Dr. Becknell. Appreciate your being with us. I know you're very busy, Reverend Becknell, Dr. Charles Becknell Sr. specifically, from the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, one of the oldest civil rights organizations, of course, in the United States. So let's get to uh, what uh, Dr. Bailey just mentioned, uh, Reverend, that, you know, the impetus to do this in the first place. What was the big driver for you to uh, start this uh, process? Well, the big driver for me was I have lived in New Mexico all my life. And I remember back in the day when politicians would come into our segregated community in Hobbs and they would pass out their literature. They would have barbecue and watermelon and beer and stuff. And then they would disappear. Right. But it told me about the significance of the Black vote in New Mexico. Now, I put together some numbers. And we are a sleeping giant. Let me just tell you about this. Please. The numbers in Las Cruces, we could turn 300 votes, Clovis 500, Belen 300, Gallup 200, all across. See, in a local election, we may not make a difference. They may let, look at the numbers and say, oh, you're only 5%, so you can't make a difference. Mm -hmm. But when we look at a statewide election and all of these numbers from these various communities, conservatively come up with about 10,000 votes. Now tell me that wouldn't make a difference in an election. They tend to forget about us. Mm -hmm. And we need to stand tall because 10,000 votes gives us dignity in this state. If there can be a demonstrable point at some point that somebody either won or lost directly from the black vote, the whole thing's gonna change. It'll be like a domino falling over. You know what I mean? The rest of them will just follow. Rodney, sorry to make you sit a little bit there. Yeah, um, no problem at Mexico all. Black Voters Collaborative, really appreciate your time for sure. All things have to happen on the ground though. There's organization, there's outreach, there's getting things going. I'm curious uh, how the uh, collaborative is reaching out to places. I mean, it's a big old state. You gotta reach down to Hobbs and Silver and, and, and so how, how's that working on the ground and, and what's the plan? We have an untapped power in the state of New Mexico and it is the black vote. And we have um, foot soldiers like uh, Mason Graham who is really reaching out to the community, making sure that we are educating uh, uh, entities around the black vote, um, pulling in our allies, um, making sure that we are educating um, Generations, we have to tie in and make sure, and, and a big thanks to uh, Dr. Harold Bailey and Dr. Uh, Charles Begnell for pulling this together, but we have to pull in not only Blacks in this effort, but we have to pull in our allies to make sure that uh, the Black voice is heard. And so again, with foot soldiers like Mason Graham um, pulling in different entities and making sure that we are all talking and collaborating together. We have an untapped power source in the black vote. Mason, that brings us to the open letter that the organization has sent out. Um, tell us about that, who it's for, and then also the, uh, Rodney just mentioned the organizations that have come on board as well. We wanna make sure we cover those folks too, but starting with the letter, who's the letter for, what's the letter about and, and who is it for? So our open letter is a 
collaboration between about 20 organizations that are all focused on civic engagement. Mm -hmm. And the letter is for the general public, especially for our youth voters and our person of color voters. In that letter, we're identifying some of the big issues that are facing voters right now. You know, we, there's a huge misinformation campaign that has continued since the 2020 election, even as early as the 2016 election. It has created a lot of apathy within not just the Black community, but in the in the youth voters as well. And a lot of people are coming into these elections thinking that their, their vote might not count. Um, with some of the policy changes that we've seen at the federal level uh, centered around some of these big issues, um, for instance, like um, the overturning of Roe v. Wade, uh, we want to make a direct correlation between the power that you have as a voter to those type of issues uh, being addressed. And so in this open letter, we uh, engage with some of the organizations that we work closely with that also have a shared interest in making sure that people get out to vote and that they understand that these kinds of uh, problems directly affect you if you do or do not go out to vote. Dr. Bailey, um, we've covered on New Mexico PBS any number of issues over the years that affect, uh, of course, the Black community, all of us in New Mexico, but specifically the Black community. I'll start with health care. And the reason I bring up an issue area is, are, are, is the organization going to be making asks of politicians in certain issue areas like health care to get a feel for where they are when it comes to the Black community? Is that, is that part of the plan as well? Yeah, healthcare, you know, most certainly is just that's high on the list, just like education. So we want to hold all the uh, department heads accountable and responsible to all the citizens in the great state of New Mexico. And, and just to add on to, I think, what uh, Brother Bo said is that not only do we want to uh, register young Black voters and, and, and young Black voters, we want to have a coalition of, of women, his, the Latinos, mm -hmm. you know, Native Americans, all types of groups, because our democracy is under attack. White supremacist ideological, uh, you know, is, is, is infiltrating our political system. So we have to make sure that we meet these, uh, these efforts with proportionate force. Rodney, pick up on that if you would. Um, you know, it, it's 10,000 is a big number in New Mexico. I mean, you know, how do we get this across to people, basically, that there, there's power things, in numbers, you know? One of the things with the New Mexico Black Voters Collaborative, we are a nonpartisan group bringing in again uh, groups that are um, really looking to influence and to uh, move the black vote. Um, my uh, co-chair is Marjorie Germain and we have been working along with Mason to really um, not look at the politicians per se, okay. but look at the issues at hand. Healthcare is one of the biggest issues that impacts us all in this state. You know, we have dramatic marginalization in the healthcare in the state for blacks. And so um, that is one issue. Also the education, um, we need to pay more attention in educating those in our own backyard, our youth, as well as those re uh, returning citizens uh, coming from uh, the incarcerated populations. We need to make sure that they are taken care of when they come back in, into our community. Um, we need to make sure that we have a pathway to the university systems here in New Mexico for our young black youth. So, so those are some of the issues that, that we are looking at and addressing. We wanna make sure that people are educated, but the most important piece is that you value your vote, you get out and vote. And if you can vote early, because your vote is gonna make a difference. Thanks again to Dr. Harold Bailey, Reverend Charles Becknell Sr., Rodney Bo, and Mason Graham, you can watch that full conversation online right now on the New Mexico In Focus Facebook page. Now, welcome back to our line opinion panelists. With Election Day on the brain, the Secretary of State's race is making headlines this week. Republican challenger Audrey Trujillo recently removed an online campaign flyer that offered a chance to win a firearm in return for a $100 donation to her campaign. The offer violated a state ban on raffles to raise money for any candidate for public office. And Justine, was this an innocent mistake or a more calculated maneuver to generate publicity? Or how did you read this? Because I, I, would, I would bet that it, most any candidate has been briefed that you cannot do raffles if you're going to run for office. Innocent mistake? Maybe a little bit of both. I okay. mean, I, I think it's, I, I don't think she intended to run afoul of, of uh, those restrictions, but 
I think it's emblematic of her campaign and mm -hmm. where she comes from and the type of candidate she is. Um, you know, there's a lot of bluster and, you know, riding this wave of Trump, the election was stolen from Trump right. and I'm just going to come, you know, so there's not a lot of philosophy there. She's not a technocrat. She's not talking about how to reform the office. She's not focused on the issues that I would hope a secretary of state would be focused on and assembling a team who is. And so it doesn't surprise me, but mm -hmm. I, but I don't, I don't think it was, I don't have any reason to think it was an intentional um, yeah. Take. Well, actually, you know, she took it down pretty quick. She had a quote in the in the paper, maybe even yours, saying, "Look, this was a mistake. The second I found out about it, we took it down." Uh, you know, fair enough. Got to give her, you know, some props on that for sure. But again, how did it get there in the first place? It's, it's, it's an easy violation to to kind of avoid, so to speak. Right. I mean, this is the kind of mistake that. Uh, reflects poorly on a candidate since these are exactly the kind of rules that a secretary of state needs to be aware of and right. in some cases to enforce. And so um, uh, filing uh, campaign finance reporting late, although this doesn't seem like a grievous sin, uh, is also an indication of, you know, this, th these are the rules that you'll have to enforce. Um, so uh, it, it's not a good look. Um, I don't think that in terms of the people looking forward to voting for her, it's going to um, make a huge difference. Mm -hmm. And just as, you know, Rep. Fox Young said, uh, she took it down immediately and said, ooh, um, right. you know, it seemed to acknowledge the error and say we want to comply with the rules. Mm -hmm. Hey, I'm not a rep anymore. It's been a long time. Sorry, former <laughs> rep. Part of that. I love that. That's very really funny. Uh, Sophie, you know, interesting. we got to get to this. As for the actual positions of both of these candidates, they couldn't be more opposite, obviously. Incumbent Democrat Maggie Toulouse-Oliver has spent her tenure working to expand voting access across the state, going on national television, uh, you know, a lot. But Ms. Trujillo wants to eliminate voting machines, mailed ballots, and early voting. Fairly drastic changes. Are voters ready for that kind of a thing? They're drastic changes, and they're also, these are programs that are popular with New Mexico's voters. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, until they became uh, politicized through the Trump administration and then, then through the Stop the, his Stop the Steal campaign, mm -hmm. you know, you, you saw voters from both parties using all of these yeah. policies to ex expand their own access to the polls. And mm -hmm. so, you know, I think you, you've painted it correctly. They, these are two diametrically opposed approaches to voting and voting rights in the state of New Mexico. Um, you know, I was thinking about this this morning. It's always telling, right, when a when a campaign involves, uh, you know, an election involves uh, a strong incumbent and then a and then a pretty weak challenger who didn't have primary, who wasn't primary, you know, mm -hmm. didn't have a head to head in the primary. It it does sort of seem like for especially for a statewide office that the Republican Party didn't think that this was particularly winnable. Mm -hmm. um, and that, and that this person is out there to make her points. I'm sure she would like to be elected, um, but I, but I just don't see this message or this person being successful in New Mexico. Mm -hmm. Algernon I, I, and Justine, I want you to get in, in on this too. Uh, by the way, I should I should mention the polling from the August 28th journal poll shows Maggie Toulouse Oliver holds more than a 10 point lead in the race. Uh, 46 to 35 percent over Ms. Trujillo. Yeah. Now, Algernon, interesting, we're not the only state where this is happening. There's at least, by my count, 10 to a dozen states, and the Washington Post has been recording, uh, reporting on this, where Republican nominees are just flat out, just talking about the legitimacy of the 2020 election, and that's probably much the entire, you know, platform at this point. Is that going to work in New Mexico, I guess, is the bottom line question. I don't see it working. Yeah. Um, I, I don't think there's a large enough community of people who are in doubt about the election result. We do have a very small, determined and vocal community of people who uh, continue to uh, question these issues. And mm -hmm. yeah, uh, Audrey Trujillo as a candidate speaks for that community um, in campaign interviews with, you know, with with media, she'll say that uh, that that 
people have questions, right? That she's running to to chase down answers to these questions and, and resolve doubts. Now, if you go and look at the body of interviews she's given to conservative hosts on the sort of podcasts and shows that are broadcast on Rumble and platforms like that, she takes a much harder line. She's referred to the election as a coup. Wow. Although when I asked her directly, she said, no, Joe Biden is the legitimate president. It's just that the process was messed up. So there are two different, hmm. you know, there are some different messages for different audiences happening here. Right. Um, Audrey Trujillo ran unopposed in that primary and um, uh, in terms of fundraising, in terms of polling, in terms of just having a very visible presence around the state, mm -hmm. uh, I, I think the incumbent is in a pretty dominant position at the moment. Mm -hmm. Justine, I got to ask you, you know, this idea of mistrust, let's not kind of step over this. There's a, that's a serious thing, not just in our country, yeah. but in our state as well. What do we need to do to get past that and, and get candidates back on solving problems? Well, it's a serious thing, and, and to some extent, it is rooted in real policy decisions. Okay. Um, you know, I mean, w one of the things that happened during the pandemic and happened in the last, under the last federal administration and you know, across the country is that um, ballots, just plain ballots were sent out. There was no, uh, in, in a lot of places, there wasn't a ballot request form and then a ballot. and. Mm -hmm. Whether you think that's good policy or not, whether you think that it's a problem for ballot integrity or not, it's it's something that reasonable policymakers should be discussing, you know, and 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 things of that ilk. I mean, if if Mr. Heo is concerned about ballot integrity and about whether there were issues in the last election, let's talk about what happened here and how it worked and 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 where there might be issues and if there. But but no, but she's not doing that, and right. and a lot of people aren't doing that, and and so this this problem of distrust it's very amorphous, and we're not getting at the real policy decisions, statutory changes, um, the work of a secretary of state, you know, on behalf of the public that needs to be done, and so I don't know how we get back there. Mm -hmm. We need candidates who really care about the work. Yep. Um, Exactly. Got a couple of minutes here. I'm going to start with this one, Sophie. We have a flyer, a mailer from the New Mexico GOP that shows an altered image of darkened hands cutting a white child's hair. There's a reason I bring up race here. Um, in the quote, um, in, the, in the flyer, it says, do you want a sex offender cutting your child's hair? And the Republican Party in New Mexico is saying, hey, no, it's not about race. It's, it's just sort of some portent. That's what we're doing here. But boy, this is literally not a good look. How did this thing strike like a you? Design, a design choice. Right, uh, exactly. Right, no, no. <laughs> um, my, you know, having looked at the image, yeah, there was a design choice. It, it was a choice that they made. And if they are so tone deaf mm -hmm. as to think that it, that's, you know, effective, but not a problem in terms of their... Um, you know, the message that they're putting out to the community, then then there are some some issues beyond the question mm -hmm. of racism. Um, but no, I think that that, you know, this is a mistake that keeps getting made. Right. Um, and if we're not learning from what happens each time or perhaps what they're learning, you know, I'm not on the inside there, but perhaps what they're learning is that's effective. Uh, it's also deeply cynical mm -hmm. and I think unacceptable. Justine, off limits, or okay, fair game. I mean, a Re House Republican Whip Rod Montoya from Farmington says the images, quote, were darkened to make the flyers gloomy. I mean, did they just miss it style-wise or was there something more nefarious going on here? Oh, I think it's pretty obvious um, what, what was going on. And yeah. I, I guess I agree with, with Sophie that it was intentional. Um, you know, it was, it was set up to have voters, have people re recall these, you know, bring forward these these racist tendencies. Um, I, I guess, I mean, it's nefarious. I'm glad we're talking about it. Right. You know, it's an issue that's gotten a lot of airtime and exposure. I, I don't think that the responses from the party are plausible or particularly well done. But but, you know, we're talking about it and and right. it's not in the shadows. And, you know, it's it's an issue that really brings forth a lot of emotion for people. That's a good point. The previously, previously seen tonight, Reverend Charles Becknell Sr. was quoted in this article saying, quote, it is time we put an end to this kind of crap. We're better than this, end quote. 
Interesting. Thank you all for that discussion. We'll be tracking that race and many others in the coming weeks ahead of the election. There's another major item on the ballot on November 8th, Constitutional Amendment 1. Now, if passed, it would put a, pull a higher percentage of money from the Permanent Land Grant Fund for education. It's gained some criticism from those who think other recent investments in education are enough for now. But recent polling from the Albuquerque Journal shows a large majority of voters support the amendment. We wanted to hear from educators and parents this week. So, senior producer Lou DeVizio sat down with a teacher, a child education advocate, and a parent who brought to light severe shortcomings in our state's educational system. Joining me today are three people who are deeply entrenched in education in our state. First, Amber Wallen, Executive Director of New Mexico Voices for Children. Thanks for being here. We also have Oriandi Melas, a teacher at UNM Children's Campus. Thanks for being here. And uh, Wilhelmina Yazzie, parent and plaintiff in the historic Yazzie Martinez lawsuit. That lawsuit put out on the record that minority students, specifically Native American and non-English speakers, haven't been getting the same education opportunities as their peers. Thank you all for being here. Ms. Wallen, you're a big part of early childhood education in our state. Um, how would this money help you deal with uh, the problems that you see every day? That's a great question. You know, and what we see is that a lot of families in our state are struggling right now. Big challenges when it comes to educational outcomes, things like childhood food insecurity, poverty amongst working parents. We know COVID made that worse for families, especially communities of color and mothers with young children. But I think it's important to note that we're also seeing some improvements and some changes in public policy that have laid a really fertile ground for what this constitutional amendment could do for New Mexico. And what it could do is it really gives voters the opportunity to have a direct hand in saying, you know, how are we prioritizing early childhood and education in our state? When you think about our early childhood space, uh, some of that funding could be used to raise teacher wages, uh, to recognize how important those workforce, that workforce is for our communities, for our families, and for our economy. Uh, it could go towards making some recent incredible expansions in child care assistance permanent for our state. And then when it comes to education, to kindergarten through 12th grade, could go towards supporting teacher salaries, uh, better attracting and keeping people in that workforce, better resourcing our schools so that, you know, so we don't have teachers having to set up GoFundMes to buy construction paper and school supplies and to really, and, and this is something uh, Ms. Diazzi can really speak to well, but uh, we know that families in our state oftentimes have faced big challenges and that wraparound services, things like uh, social workers in our schools, school nurses, school counselors, ensuring we're providing culturally and linguistically representative educational services, these are all key for success. Uh, now, Ms. Mellis, I, you have a different perspective here working with children every day. How could you see that money being applied in some of the ways that Ms. Wallen just mentioned, directly impacting the actual children in your classroom? Yeah, so I completely agree um, with that statement. Um, the one thing that I want to say that I disagree is that every fund or every money or amount of money given to early education has passed through several obstacles before it actually gets to teachers' pockets. Uh, me being one of them is you have this, um, group of money that it's supposed to go towards specific things or towards specific people or to a specific plan and there is it's like a ladder there's um, it goes from the state to the school from the school to the admins and then the teachers are the last to either see or hear about that money um, it doesn't usually ends up in the teachers pockets um, nowhere in salaries or nowhere inside the classroom that can actually impact the um, education or the environment of those children. And so um, when it comes to these discussions, we really have to think about the people who are making those decisions and the people who are sitting there evaluating what this money should go into because most of the time it's really not going into um, what we really want, which is teacher salaries and inside the classroom. And so then if you really want to ask someone um, how to invest the money and where to put it, I think it should come from the teacher inside that classroom. Ms. Yazi, a few months ago, uh, the state released its draft plan to help address the lawsuit that you were a part of. First, do you think that that plan goes far enough to bridge the gap that you exposed? And second, how would the extra money that's on the ballot help in that effort also? So the plan came out. Um, it's great to see the plan, but you know, we can't 
invest in our, we, we, there's a plan, but we need to also invest in our children to start working and to start helping our children. So um, with this Constitutional Amendment 1 um, and the funding that will be provided for our children, that'll help us in a great amount with what we were fighting for for our children through the school, um, the Yazi Martinez lawsuit. Um, you know, um, there's four groups in our lawsuit. There's our Native American children, there's our um, English language learner children, our children with disability, and children that come from um, low income. Those are the four basic, uh, the four groups that are we represent in the school suit. Um, overall, uh, with this um, funding, it'll really help our children to, we've been saying this over and over, you know, um, that we need to support our children in a way that we prepare them for life, um, to be college and career ready. And I am very firm with that because as a Diné Navajo um, mother, my mother was an educator for a very long time too. So I kind of have that history and know a little bit of that experience. So um, with that, you know, just preparing our children just to thrive and to learn, that's pretty much the basic and most important that for this um, funding is just to prepare our children. We have more money than we had in the past. There was a legislative brief that uh, was released recently that showed that it, the state has reached a funding benchmark that was set in the lawsuit, but, and now there's an opportunity for more money, but are you satisfied with how that money would be spent, the specific ways that that money would be spent? Like you say, money's good, but it needs to be applied in a specific way. Would you like to see more direction from the state on that? Um, well, I, you use the word, the term satisfied. Um, I think when I'll be satisfied is when our children are thriving and when our Native American children and the four group children are given the opportunity and are excelling. Um, I haven't seen that as a parent um, in our public school system yet. There's no changes. So, um, you know, we talk about funding, that uh, funding is the main issue. Well, you know, we have this opportunity now we have this great opportunity to amend the Constitution, one, to provide for our children, to get that funding out, to use that funding that's been sitting there. Um, this is a great way to start, to use it towards our children. You know, that's our, our, that's our first priority. Um, and, you know, to see the future um, that they're thriving and they're learning and given what they're needed. Now, I, some opponents of the Constitutional Amendment uh, point to the fact that oil and gas revenue is booming right now. And that means that because it's a percentage base right now, it's 5% of the uh, land grant permanent fund that would come out, that the dollar amount is also increasing. What would you say to that uh, concern, that the money's already rising, but and now there's a chance to bring in more? Yeah, why now? I think that's a great question, and it's an important one because it's true the state's in a really strong fiscal position right now, but that is largely based on temporary sources. So we know that part of that is from, from federal COVID relief, which we know is obviously time limited. And then as you said, Lou, part of that is because we're in that boom point of the oil and gas cycle. But the reality is we've seen this so many times over the years when the oil and gas industry is doing well, so too our state revenues, uh, when the industry inevitably a few years later goes bust, so to do revenues and we see harm in our state budget. Meanwhile, we've seen the state's land grant permanent fund or the permanent school fund go from 10 billion in 2009 when New Mexico Voices first started working on this issue to now almost $26 billion climbing steadily over the years. So what we really need to be having the conversation now is really how are we diversifying the revenue that goes to these incredibly important programs. Uh, I have one final question for all of you guys, so I'll go around the table starting with you, Ms. Yazi. Mm -hmm. um, as a state, New Mexico is unfortunately near the bottom of every national education metric. Starting fundamentally, if we were to get more funding, what fundamental changes would need to happen in order to turn that around? Uh, well, first of all, you know, um, just make our children a priority. Uh, that's the first step. Um, especially now with early childhood education. Um, that's, I think, the beginning of where, you know, they start learning and um, where we start to prepare them. Um, so that's where these programs are very crucial and um, the funding and everything. So from this Yazi Martinez school suit, um, I started the case when my son, my oldest son, was in third grade. 
and now he's in his second year of college. And we won the case almost five years ago, and that was a big step to try to, you know, um, get our education system back on track to get off of that 50th in the country. Um, we haven't seen many changes yet. I haven't seen many changes. And again, like um, the teachers, um, that's another thing, you know, as she mentioned that they're not supported enough. And then I totally agree with that. Um, they're not given all the support that they're needed. Um, they're not paid enough. And especially early childhood education right now, they are in the most important years of our children's lives um, with this at, at that stage, pre-K, kindergarten, you know. And my traditional aspect, you know, we children, we hold our children very um, sacred. Um, there's a lot that goes with that. It's our priority and our responsibility to set them in the path of what we call, in my language, ina, which is life. So thank you. Of course, thank you. Fundamentally, beyond money, what needs to change in our understanding of education and how we treat our children? I think um, what we really need to first accept is that early childhood educators are teachers and they do, um, like she said, the most important part of every child's life developmentally um, and they need to be um, given that credit. I mean, they need to be recognized. They need to be uh, looked at the same level as any other teachers in the other uh, grade levels because, um, you know, infant teachers or um, toddler teachers, they are working just as hard, they're doing as much research, and they're supporting those skills to benefit those in first, second, third, fourth grade. So just funding salaries and funding programs that these children can keep starting from an early age all the way to graduation or college even. Building on what the other two said, foundational changes that will help pull us as a state out of the bottom of education. You know, I think the most important thing that we can be doing right now is putting our kids first in every public policy decision that we make. You know, I'm a data person. There's mountains of research about how critical those early years are. Mountains of research about the ties between early childhood programs and how important the teachers are for setting kids on a path to success, to improving health and economic and educational outcomes throughout their life. But I'd also say that you know, as, you, as you've heard today, parents don't need a stack of research papers to tell you what having access to high quality and reliable and affordable early childhood educators and education really means to their families. And businesses don't need control groups and they don't need decades of research to tell you that when they're workers have access to reliable childcare and education, they themselves are more reliable employees. So I think that this is really common sense policy, but constitutional amendment number one on November 8th really has the opportunity to build in some transformational public policy as well, because if we are giving all of our kids in the state the opportunity to really thrive, we're also doing that for our families, for our workforce, for our economy, and for our state for so many generations to come. Amber Wallen, Oriandi Melas, and Wilhelmine Yazzie, thank you all for joining us. Thank you for having us. Thanks. Welcome back to our line of opinion panelists. We're gonna pick up right where we're, our last segment left off, talking about educational outcomes in our state. A recent legislative brief shows the state has reached the funding benchmarks set in the Yazzie Martinez ruling. Securing that money was step one of the response to that lawsuit and now years later we have it. But is there enough direction, Sophie Martin, for how that money will be used? Meaning, is there enough clarity on the front end of this? We always seem to put the money in the pot first and figure that bit out later. What's your sense of it this well, time? Well, I, I love that you point that out because there is a certain <laughs> cart horse kind right. of, did I say that in an earlier segment too? Maybe I did about something else, but mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, it is it is encouraging, I think, to see that we have not just met but have exceeded um, the allocation requirements set in the in the lawsuit. You know, in the order from that lawsuit, um, it is. Uh, but the details are going to be really challenging, and there is a certain amount of flexibility that's allowed within. Uh, within the order. And so it's it's hard, I think, today to predict. Uh, well, and let me put it a different different way. I'm pretty much sure that I can predict that um, we won't a year from now, two years from now, be like, oh, thank goodness. 
problem completely solved right. um, because this is going to be an ongoing process. It's not a one-time fix. And um, the, the problems in our educational system are um, deeply entrenched and also go beyond just our school systems. Mm -hmm. That's a very good point. That's a good reminder for this whole thing. Uh, Algernon Mizyazi mentioned the frustration she's had over the time it's taken to make the changes she fought for. Now, when she started the lawsuit, for example, her eldest son was in the third grade, now he's in college. <laughs> and that pretty much underscores how dedicated she has been to making these changes for the greater good, for sure. But how long is too long here? Are we letting down an entire generation of young people here as we, these grown-ups try to fix this problem? What comes to mind is that when you're steering a ship, mm -hmm. even when you need to change course and you know exactly where you want to head, it takes quite a bit of time and it can be measured in years to write the course. Mm -hmm. Add to that that I'm not convinced that as a society, we do have a clear sense of what direction we want to head into. And I okay. think that we as parents, as voters, as taxpayers, and, and people like me who report on education really need to keep asking these questions about what is it that we want education to produce? We, we can talk a lot about putting children first, prioritizing our children, preparing them, but for what? Right. Do we think of education as simply making them sort of economically fit? Yep. Um, or is there more to how we want people to grow up and, and become the kinds of adults that our society needs to be happy and healthy. Mm -hmm. um, and that's hard. And we depend so much on our school system for such an array of services. Um, how do we reverse these metrics that are so dismal? Uh, what do we think of these metrics in the first place? Mm -hmm. What do we want our schools to do? It's a very complicated question. Yep. And any course correction takes a generation. That's fair. That's fair, I appreciate that, that little perspective there. Uh, Justine, interesting, the, the, the winds behind this, so to speak, in the Albuquerque Journal poll on Constitutional Amendment 1, 69% of the public is in favor. That's gotta mean something. Uh, well, it does, but like anything, if you told them that the schools have carried forward half a billion dollars in cash balances, and you told them that they got $1.5 billion in federal funds over the last year, and you told them that we have addressed mm -hmm. teacher salaries, and we have addressed instructional materials and we have really addressed the things that the legislature can address right. by throwing money at the problem maybe some people wouldn't have that view but we don't tell them that we say as algernon says this is for the kids i mean this is how the gross receipts tax started in new mexico one cent for the kids you know mm -hmm. and who's who's going to vote against the kids mm -hmm. nobody mm -hmm. um but but what i think what algernon saying is really important we need to ask some fundamental questions and many of these questions are local. Many of these questions need to be addressed at the public education department in terms of priorities. They need to be looking at the data that they're getting back from some of their pilot programs. This mm -hmm. is a process that takes time. But I mean, we could raise their cash balances 10 times over and nothing's gonna change. Yeah. Hey, so for perspective on what Justine's was saying, Justine is mentioning mm -hmm. here, annual funding for early childhood programs has gone from 179 million to 579 million in just a 10 year period. And the Early Childhood Trust Fund has only been around since 2020 and it's loaded with money. I, you know, do we need more money through the CA1? I mean, it, well, and, and meanwhile, is mm -hmm. there one more counselor or social worker on the ground at Zuni? I mean, there are there are tangible things that need yep. to be done. And are they being done? That's a good and point. I mean, the Legislative Finance Committee says they aren't. Yep. You know, Gene, something that really strikes mm -hmm. me, you know, about the the change in the dollar amounts that have been available for early childhood education mm -hmm. is this, you know, these programs are new to have gone to have to see that increase in funding over a very short period of time. Mm -hmm. Um, is it's first of all, it's stunning, and I think many would agree that it's stunning that it took us so long yep. to prioritize funding for early childhood education programs. Mm -hmm. um, but it is also a reminder that, as as both Algernon and Justine have said, it's not just like you turn on a spigot and it it happens. There has right. to be planning. There has to be. As Justine, I think, just said research. You know, um, so it is difficult at this moment to say whether the funds have been effective, whether, I think it's also difficult to say whether we need more funds. I think perhaps for some perspective, you know, uh, 
it's worth noting that this amendment would take the annual distribution from 5% to 6.25%. So there's a 1.25% change in the amounts of the district, you know, the, I should say the percentage of the distribution. Right. Right. Um, and so, you know, that, that, small bit may also sort of feel like, ah, oh, that's, you know, that's nothing. Yep. Um, but it is, it is a, a still, I'm just going to repeat, it's mind blowing um, that it has been such a short period of time that we've been working on that. Mm -hmm. This, it is, it, at this point, I'm not prepared to say though, uh, we don't need this extra money or we do. It's just, uh, it's too complex um, to just sort of, as, as has been said, like just vote for the children. Like, what are we doing with it? Right. Yeah. Exactly right. Aljun, I got one minute here, but I got to ask you in that interview with Lou, we heard uh, Orianda Mellis, the teacher at UNM's Children's Campus, wants teachers to have more of a say in how that money Sophie's talking about is distributed. Should the state create a panel of teachers who have some level of authority when it comes to these kind of allocations? I mean, seems to make sense. Well, if we can't let teachers run the schools outright. Right. <laughs> Good point um, there. It should be an interesting experiment, wouldn't it? Yeah. <clears throat> um, but yeah, I mean, this is something that teachers express in in our, you know, uh, down here we have the second and the fourth largest school districts. And this is something Reminder. educators raise all the time is that uh, the resources available to us goes up and down, but we, you know, often find out at the last minute and don't get to really make a lot of decisions about how it's allocated. Mm -hmm. Good point there. Hey, thanks again to our line panel as always. Hey, be sure to let us know what you think about any of the topics, and they were good ones, that we covered on our Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram pages. And catch up on any episodes you may have missed on the PBS video app on your Roku or smart TV. Hi, I'm Laura Paskus, senior producer of Our Land. You are familiar with our field segments and studio interviews. But I also want to make sure that you know about the middle school lesson plans we've developed. These are based around topics we cover right here on New Mexico PBS. Topics like climate change, water, wildlife, fire, even environmental careers. These lesson plans, which you can find on the PBS Learning Media site, meet national and state standards. So head to our website where you can download videos, student handouts, find additional data, and explore all sorts of lesson plans. These are lesson plans and student activities that help connect New Mexico middle school students with the natural world around them. Find out more online. Much thanks to the men for the New Mexico Black Voters Collaborative for their time with me this week for our midweek Facebook Live conversation. It's an important and timely effort. As Reverend Becknell mentioned, small numbers acting in unison can get results. And the African-American community in New Mexico statewide could use some results, particularly on the issue areas mentioned in the interview, healthcare and education. Now, at this point, the community is within its electoral rights to start making some demands of our elected folk on these issues. Because when you look at the numbers for outcomes for African-Americans in health and education, we cannot expect better results from indifferent policymakers. As I mentioned to the group, the time may be ripe for African-Americans to either make or break a candidate to get some movement on these issues, because at the end of the voting day, that's honestly the only card we have left to play. Thanks again for joining us, for staying informed and engaged. We'll see you again next week in Focus. Funding for New Mexico in Focus provided by viewers like you.